It's nearly Mother's Day, and of course, my twisted little brain goes right to thinking about the worst kind of mom. The kind who harms or even kills their own kids to satisfy their need for attention and sympathy. Today, we're going to take a look at the first publicly known case of Munchausen syndrome by proxy, which also might be the worst. A mother who murdered not one, not two, but at least eight of her own children, Mary Beth Tenning. Let's get into it. Hi folks and welcome back to my channel. Thank you so much for spending time with me. If you're new here, I'm Delaney, a true crime writer and all-around murder nerd. On this channel, I like to take deep dives into some of the worst cases and I tend to cuss a lot. So if that sounds like your idea of a good time, go ahead and subscribe. If not, that's cool. You do you. Today I want to talk about one of the most awful, but also kind of fascinating criminal pathologies, Munchausen syndrome by proxy. In the DSM, it's now called factitious disorder imposed on another or FDIA. There have been several high profile FDIA cases in the last few years. You're probably familiar with the case of Dee Dee and Gypsy Rose Blanchard, or maybe Lacey Spears and her son Gannett, or a more recent case, that of Kelly Renee Turner and her daughter Olivia Gant, that I covered in an earlier video. I'll put a link in the description if you want to check that out. But the first known case of FDIA is still probably the worst. The case of Mary Beth Tinning, the mother who killed eight and possibly nine of her own children between 1972 and 1985. Mary Beth Rowe was born in a small town in upstate New York on September 11th, 1942, and her childhood fits with most of the profile for an FDIA abuser. Her father, Alton, was away for some of her early childhood fighting in World War II. Her mother, Ruth, had to work outside the home, so Mary Beth was often shuffled around with different relatives. She said one of these relatives told her that she had been unwanted, and she had good reason to believe it. Both her parents were emotionally unavailable and Mary Beth claims her father abused her. She also said that she would be locked in a closet whenever she cried. During her school years, she was described as not having many friends, but was constantly thirsty for attention. Classmates said she was moody and would lie and exaggerate to make herself seem more important. She graduated in 1961 and wanted to go on to college, but her grades weren't good enough. So she worked at a few low-wage jobs before becoming a nursing assistant at Ellis Hospital in nearby Schenectady. It was here where she met Joseph Tinning in 1963 on a blind date. He was quiet and easygoing, as are most husbands of FDIA abusers, and they were married two years later. The couple's first child, Barbara, was born in May 1967. Then in January 1970, Joseph Jr. was born. Both were healthy, happy babies, and by all accounts, Mary Beth was a good mother to them. She had said once that all she ever wanted was to be married and have children, and now she had both of those things. But apparently, she wasn't actually happy with that. In October 1971, while Mary Beth was pregnant with her third child, Jennifer, her father suffered a massive heart attack while at work. Still desperate for his love and approval, Mary Beth rushed to his bedside, but even on his deathbed, Alton refused to show his daughter even the slightest hint of affection. When he died, she was devastated. And that seemed to set off a domino effect of death in the Tinning family. First, only two months later in December, Mary Beth gave birth to Jennifer at Ellis Hospital. But far from being a joyous occasion, Jennifer's birth was complicated and dangerous. She'd been born with a massive brain infection. While neonatal infections like that aren't unheard of, there is one troubling fact about this one. Nurses at the hospital said that Mary Beth admitted she had tried to induce labor early in order to give birth on Christmas Day. Jennifer only lived for eight days before dying from hemorrhagic meningitis and multiple brain abscesses. The nurses noted that Mary Beth seemed to show no emotion when she was told her daughter had died. 
After Jennifer's death, she washed, ironed, and folded her clothes, then packed them all up along with all her toys and furniture and got rid of everything. Meanwhile, now Mary Beth's cup was overflowing with the one thing she craved all her life, attention. Neighbors and family members surrounded her with sympathy and kindness, possibly for the first time in her life. But people noticed that she was acting odd. Friends and family members recalled that at Jennifer's funeral, she never shed a tear. And at the reception afterwards, she seemed to be actually enjoying herself. Now, nobody wanted to accuse a mother who had just lost a newborn baby, so their suspicions were ignored or explained away as shock or denial or just having a stoic nature. But then, only 17 days after Jennifer's death, tragedy would strike the tinning children again. On January 20th, 1972, Mary Beth took her two-year-old son, Joseph Jr., to the Ellis Hospital ER. She claimed he'd suffered a seizure, but the nurses and doctors couldn't find anything wrong with him. They treated him for a viral infection and after 10 days, sent him home. Hours after leaving the hospital with him, Mary Beth came right back carrying the toddler in her arms. He was blue and not breathing. She claimed she had laid him down for a nap and when she went back in to check on him, she'd found him like this. He was pronounced dead on arrival. His death was attributed to cardiopulmonary arrest and no autopsy was performed on a two-year-old. Once again, Mary Beth was showered with attention and sympathy. Once again, she carefully folded and packed away her dead child's clothes and toys. Six weeks went by before the tragedy repeated itself. This time, Mary Beth rushed their last living child, Barbara, who was now four, to the Ellis ER, again claiming her child had gone into seizures. This time, knowing about the deaths of her two other children, the hospital wanted to keep Barbara under close observation, but Mary Beth refused and took her home instead. And this is where my red flag detector would have been going off the charts. She just had a child die six weeks ago from a quote seizure, but when her next child has that same symptom, the mother doesn't want to keep her child in the hospital for observation. Then, just like with Joseph Jr., she was back at the ER only hours later with an unconscious Barbara. Despite the staff's best efforts, she slipped into a coma and died. Her death was attributed this time to Reyes syndrome, and again, no autopsy was performed. Her neighbors, at least, were shocked that two apparently healthy children would just suddenly up and die. Some of them, along with some doctors, speculated that they must be carrying some mysterious death gene that caused them to stop breathing. But other people were squinting. One neighbor recalled that the day Barbara had been taken into the ER, she had been over at that neighbor's house playing, and she'd seemed perfectly fine. Then, when Mary Beth told her it was time to go, the four-year-old, predictably, started to throw a fit. The neighbor said that Mary Beth then threatened to punish the little girl and said to her, you're going to go be with your brother. A nurse at Ellis also had suspicions, which she voiced to the doctor, as was official protocol in those days. And the doctor blew her off, which was the unofficial protocol. Maybe Mary Beth sensed that people were becoming suspicious, or maybe she was just upset that she'd run out of sympathy tickets. She started becoming more moody and withdrawn. So, thinking a change of scenery might do them some good, the Tinnings, now childless, moved to a new neighborhood not too far away. Mary Beth took a job waitressing at a restaurant. In 1973, she got pregnant with their fourth child, and her co-workers threw her a shower, because remember, she had always given away all of her kids' things after they died. On Thanksgiving Day, she gave birth to Timothy. Timothy was a little underweight at five pounds, but otherwise healthy. However, little Timothy would not last long. When he was just three weeks old, Mary Beth brought his lifeless body back to the hospital, claiming she had found him that way in his crib. The doctors could find nothing obviously wrong with him, but again, did not do an autopsy. His death was attributed to SIDS. Once again, Mary Beth ironed, folded, and packed up all of Timothy's things and gave them away. Then, the following year, 1974, 
Joseph complained to his brother that his food had started tasting bitter. His brother, who had his suspicions about Mary Beth, urged him to have it tested, but Joe blew him off. Then one night, in the middle of the night, Joe's brother and sister-in-law got a panicked call from Mary Beth. She kept saying Joe was dead. They rushed over to their house and found Joe unconscious on the floor next to the bed. Mary Beth was fully dressed, crying and saying, I didn't do it. She had not called the police or the hospital. When Joe was finally admitted to the hospital, they discovered he had a near fatal dose of barbiturates in his system. Joe, however, declined to press charges. On Easter Sunday, 1975, their fifth child, Nathan, was born. Mary Beth's co-workers were kind of shocked that she would choose to have another child when it seemed like they were all doomed to live extremely short lives. But she told them, I'm a woman, that's what women are supposed to do. Anyway, they threw her another baby shower, and they all said they hoped that this baby would beat the curse of its siblings. In light of that family curse, after he was born, Nathan had been sent home with an apnea monitor. That September, Mary Beth showed up at the restaurant where she worked, carrying his lifeless body. She claimed he'd just stopped breathing while they were in the car. Somehow, amongst all the chaos she'd just caused, her co-workers called the hospital and urged Mary Beth to take Nathan in immediately. But she didn't take him to Ellis Hospital, which was closer. Instead, she drove him to St. Clair's, where he was pronounced dead on arrival. Again, there seemed to be no obvious reason for an otherwise healthy five-month-old baby to be dead, yet no autopsy was performed. His death was also attributed to SIDS. Afterwards, Mary Beth repeated her little ritual of ironing and packing away all his things. And now, suspicions were really growing. Mary Beth's sister-in-law noted that she seemed to treat the children's funerals like a party where she was the guest of honor. She also noted that Mary Beth was a lavish spender, and when the children's insurance payouts would arrive, yes, she had insurance policies on them, she would go on a spending spree. She even recalled Mary Beth saying, quote, We just got the check for Nathan, so we're going out to get new drapes and wallpaper. A few years later, the Tinnings applied to become adoptive parents. And rather than raising red flags, their past led caseworkers to feel sorry for them. They were first placed with a young boy who was only with them for such a short time, no one even remembered him. Then they fostered a 10-year-old girl. Now Joe seemed to be taken with the girl and apparently they had grown close. However, when Mary Beth got pregnant again, she sent the girl back to the agency. In August, 1978, the Tinnings adopted a boy named Michael shortly after he was born. Then, on October 29th, she gave birth to her sixth biological child, Mary Frances. By all accounts, Mary Beth seemed to lose interest in Michael once Mary Frances was born. Less than three months later, in January 1979, Mary Beth rushed Mary Frances to the ER with the familiar story about a seizure. Thankfully, the doctors were able to revive her. But only a month later, she returned to the hospital with Mary Frances in full cardiac arrest. She was again revived, but had sustained irreversible brain damage. Two days later, she was taken off life support and died shortly afterwards. Mary Beth got pregnant again shortly after the funeral. In the fall, their eighth child and seventh biological child, Jonathan, was born. In March 1980, Mary Beth showed up at St. Clair's Hospital with him, unconscious. Like Mary Frances, he was revived, but because of the family history, he was sent to Boston Hospital for more tests. The doctors there could find no medical reason why he would have just stopped breathing. So Jonathan was sent home with his mother. A few days later, she was back at St. Clair's with him. Only this time, he was brain dead. He died March 24, 1980, after being kept on life support for four weeks. While there were many people who had their suspicions about Mary Beth, you have to remember that FDIA hadn't been identified yet, so no one knew that was even a thing. The doctors at the time were convinced her babies were all victims of some mysterious genetic disorder. But a year later, in March 1981, Mary Beth took Michael, their adopted son, to the doctor's office. She claimed that she couldn't wake him up that morning. But rather than taking him right across the street to Ellis Hospital, she had waited hours until her doctor's office was open. 
By the time the doctor had examined him, Michael was already dead. Now, because Michael was not related to the Tinnings, that theory that the deaths had some kind of genetic origin was not holding water. Now, finally, doctors, social workers, family members, and neighbors began to voice their suspicions to authorities. But nothing was done. The Tinnings' ninth child, Tammy Lynn, was born in August of 1985. In December of that year, Mary Beth called her neighbor, Cynthia Walter, in a panic. Cynthia had just been to their home earlier that day, playing with a seemingly healthy Tammy Lynn. Cynthia rushed over to find the baby lying on a changing table, purple, not breathing, and unresponsive. Mary Beth had not called an ambulance, so Cynthia ordered her to do so. The EMTs arrived and rushed the baby to the hospital, where she was pronounced dead on arrival. Mary Beth claimed Tammy Lynn had, quote, gotten tangled in a blanket. But this time, no one was buying her story. The doctors could find no apparent cause of death, and now that her history of so many dead children was known, everything was pointing to foul play. And Mary Beth's suspicious behavior continued after Tammy Lynn's death. Cynthia, the neighbor who Mary Beth had called instead of the ambulance, had dropped by the Tinnings house the day after Tammy Lynn died to offer her condolences. She said the couple was calmly eating breakfast, apparently unfazed that their baby had just died. Later, after Tammy Lynn's funeral, Mary Beth hosted a brunch where she was smiling and chatting with her guests. Her sister even said it didn't seem to bother her. For once, an autopsy was performed, but it failed to determine a cause of death, so it was attributed to SIDS. However, the chief of police was not satisfied with that finding. He reached out to forensic pathologist Dr. Michael Bodden to ask him the $64,000 question, was it possible for nine children from the same family to die of SIDS? Baden said, absolutely not. When I looked at the medical records, I found that the doctors were attributing all of these deaths to a genetic problem in the family. When children with genetic disease die, they die slowly. They get symptoms, they get sick. They don't die like putting out a light bulb. They die more like a fan that gradually comes to a stop. He quoted Dr. Roy Meadows' law, one sudden infant death is a tragedy, two is suspicious, and three is murder until proved otherwise. After looking through the children's medical files, Baden noticed several facts that raised red flags. There was an adopted baby, Michael, nothing genetically the same as the parents. And suddenly, at three years of age, that baby died under similar circumstances as the other children. The concept that the cause of death was inherited was clearly wrong. The other thing I noted was that the only person with the babies when they died was the mother. Many of the babies were blue when they were seen at the hospital. If a baby is blue, it's not SIDS. SIDS babies look perfectly healthy. When a baby that's been previously healthy turns blue and then dies, it means there's some kind of obstruction to their ability to breathe, some kind of suffocation. I told the police that the Tinning children had died of homicidal asphyxia. He also believed that Jennifer had been, quote, the victim of a coat hanger that Mary Beth had likely used to try and induce labor. On February 4th, 1986, Mary Beth was brought in for questioning by the Schenectady Police Department about the death of Tammy Lynn. At first, she denied any wrongdoing, but after hours of questioning, she did finally admit to killing three of the children, Tammy Lynn, Nathan, and Timothy. She admitted to smothering them with a pillow because, as she said, I am not a good mother. That's the understatement of the century. Later, Mary Beth was allowed to meet with Joe at the station. There, she admitted to him that she killed Tammy. A court stenographer was brought in and Mary Beth dictated a 36-page confession where she admitted to smothering three of her children. But she continued to deny having anything to do with the other children's deaths. She was arrested and charged with second-degree murder for the death of Tammy Lynn. After her arrest, the bodies of three of her children were ordered to be exhumed. In one case, 
confusion over the location of one of the graves resulted in the exhumation of the wrong body. The other two were too decomposed to provide any evidence. Her arrest sent shockwaves through Schenectady and the case was covered extensively in the national media. There was a lot of blame pointed at the doctors, social workers, coroners, and even neighbors. Eight children had died under highly suspicious circumstances, but no one seemed to have noticed the pattern. A big part of the problem was, of course, a lack of communication between the various medical examiner's offices and doctors who handled the tinning baby's deaths. Some of the children's deaths had been attributed to natural causes, so no investigations were done. The murder trial of Mary Beth Tinning opened on June 22, 1987. She was only charged with the death of Tammy Lynn since there wasn't enough evidence to charge her with the other deaths. At first, she tried to recant her confession, but the judge ruled it admissible. The trial was dominated by the testimonies of medical experts. Each side called six different pathologists, each with a different opinion about what caused the deaths of the Tinning children. Perhaps the most persuasive of these was Dr. Marie Valdez de Pena, an expert on SIDS. She testified that Tammy Lynn could not have died of SIDS, but in fact had been suffocated. Mary Beth did not take the stand in her own defense. The jury deliberated for 29 hours over three days before they reached their verdict. Mary Beth Tinning was found guilty of second degree murder. She was later sentenced to 20 years to life in the Bedford Hills Prison for Women. In 1989, she was indicted for the murders of Nathan and Timothy, the other two children she had confessed to killing, but the charges were later dropped for lack of evidence. Nowadays, we tend to think of FDIA mothers as inducing illnesses and disabilities in their children over long periods of time in order to garner consistent levels of attention and sympathy. But Mary Beth Tinning didn't do that. She probably didn't have the patience or intelligence, frankly, to deal with such an elaborate long-term fraud. Instead, it was the deaths of her children that fulfilled her need for attention, sympathy, and even admiration. Not to mention a nice insurance check to spend on herself. Then she could just get pregnant again and again be rewarded with attention and gifts. But once the boring day-to-day -day life of raising children set in, she was no longer the center of attention. And so, another tragic death would put poor Mary Beth back into the spotlight, and the cycle would repeat. After serving 31 years behind bars, Mary Beth Tinning was released on parole on August of 2018. She was 76. She went back to Schenectady to live with Joe, and according to media reports, is laying low. I got most of my information from this book, From Cradle to Grave, by Joyce Eggington. I also got a lot of info from Dr. Bodden's book, Unnatural Death. I'll put links to those in the description. If you're still here, thank you so much for hanging in there. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like and subscribe for more deep dives like this. And consider supporting me on Patreon. The link is in the description. Till next time, darklings. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like and subscribe for more. You can help me make more true crime content by supporting me on Patreon, where for as little as a cup of coffee, you can get early access to videos, bonus content, and free Murder Nerd merch. The link is in the description.